This version of the Illuminati were more based around the ability of one woman to be a sort of prophet. The other people to use the term were a little bit more interested in the occult, in this case, the Rosicrucians. Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry do bear a set of resemblances, but unlike the medieval form, the Masonic form is exclusively Christian. And the Rosicrucians also sprung out another order, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, who they themselves were also very occultist and not Masonic and not Christian. As well, as far as the connections between the Freemasons and the Illuminati here go, the Rosicrucians of Freemasonry are not any sort of official branch of Freemasonry. They are a voluntary appendant body. But as I said, when people are talking about the Illuminati, they're typically not talking about the Alumbrados, nor are they talking about the Rosicrucians. In reality, they're talking about a group formed by a man named Adam von Weishaupt, who was a canon law professor at the University of Ingolstadt in the late 18th century. And this man founded his Order of the Illuminati in the Electorate of Bavaria. Now I could go into the history of the Holy Roman Empire and what electorate means, but I'll just tell you this. Basically, not an empire, not holy, not Roman, but it was essentially a confederation of different German states who all agreed to caucus under the rule of one guy. That's the simplest way to put it. His order originally consisted of himself and four students and went by the name Bund der Perfectibilisten or the Covenant of Perfectibility. Founded May 1st, 1776, they took Minerva's owl as their symbol, which is something that you might see if you watch anything about Bohemian Grove. Everybody in the order took aliases at first, with Weishaupt being Brother Spartacus, and then his other students, Mazenhausen, Bauhoff, Mortz, and Suter, taking the names Ajax, Agathon, Tiberius, and Erasmus. Now, Erasmus was later ejected from the order for indolence, or being lazy. From its inception, the order was most targeting students who were inquisitive minds, eager to learn, and most importantly had no real-world experience and were very naive and gullible. But Weishaupt was aware that there was there was no way of sustaining that. He wasn't going to create what he was looking to create, and we'll get into exactly what it was, just by attracting students into his order. In fact, he might start to seem pretty creepy. No, he needed to associate himself with older men and men of means and status, people who could actually help him to advance his goals, not just be kind of an army of psychophants. To this end, after initially opposing the idea, Weishaupt made the decision to join the Freemasons in 1777. This had a dual purpose. Part of it was to learn about their ritual structure, understand how they functioned, because they were quite successful at it, and also to find himself a body of recruits who, while they wouldn't be quite as gullible as his students, would start with some of the same generally liberal ideas of the Enlightenment and be, hopefully, in this case, easier to persuade. It is also important to note that the political situation where Weishaupt was in Bavaria was not the same as it is today, nor the same as it was in the other strongholds of Freemasonry, like the UK and what was going to become the United States. Weishaupt was in Germany, and at this time, Germany was not yet Germany, it was the Germanys, a collection of princedoms, electorates, duchies, all these other small little things that all kind of fell under the Holy Roman Emperor. It wasn't a united country yet, and considering that masonry typically operates on a state or national level at the Grand Lodge level, it made it much easier to infiltrate Freemasonry, where you had much smaller sects and a lot more division and far less organizational structure. So he joined Prudence Lodge of the Right of Strict Observance in February of 1777. For the Masons in the room, the Right of Strict Observance was an offshoot of the Scottish Rite, imbued with German ethnic pride, so to be clear, ethnic pride is not typically considered a Masonic virtue. Initially, the Illuminati stood to do a few things. They wanted to oppose abuses of government power, oppose superstition, and oppose the involvement of the church in state affairs. These ideas, of course, did appeal to Freemasons, who hold geometry, philosophy, logic, and the liberal arts in general as some of their core central values. What didn't appeal to Freemasons about Illuminati values were the fact that they wanted to overthrow government, so they were fomenting revolution, which is not, again, a Masonic value, and also that they wanted to completely dismantle Christianity, get rid of it, and replace it with an atheist system of values. Both of these things are antithetical to Freemasonry, especially the latter, as believing in a creator is one of the 
most important things that you have to do to become a Freemason. But that whole issue between Weishaupt's goal of getting rid of religion and Freemasonry's core value of having religion, that, that was not enough to deter him from joining, pretending he believed in God, and then taking all of the Masonic rituals and symbols, corrupting them, and bringing them back to his own order. In 1778, the Covenant of Perfectibility was renamed to the Order of the Illuminati for the purpose of, well, it just kind of sounded weird calling it the other thing. They adopted a modified Masonic structure with the first three degrees of Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master being replaced with Novice, Minerva, and Illuminatus. Dose. 22's allegations are true, but pardoned like his dad, Grand Mason Tools, attending Clinton parties with the Zionist Jews and Skull and Bones. The number is 322. Three times 22, that sounds like 666 to me. I don't know. I appreciate the dono, though. L Lush Dose going crazy. I talked to Gina the other day. Going to be, um, got some things in the works with Gina on some other tips. Would love to do some cypher content with Gina. You already know. Damn, tied in with Epstein is crazy. Crazy. But who y'all got in the Canelo fight tonight? What we doing? <laughs> we just talking shit. Rolling Stone cover Adam? Yeah. Yeah, they said that dude's name was Grand Mason. I'm sorry? And they did? Grand Master? Or Grand, Grand Mason. M-A-I-S-O-N. Grand Mason. Well, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was was paused for a second. Funny what a name could do, right? M A I S O N. I'm googling it. That's like Maison. Put, that's, put that's the French name. on it, Mel. It's what's that? It his level like in that'll, that'll hang a black dude. That, that's what it sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> Word. Yeah. That sounds very different from Adam Twenty Two. I like how people rebrand themselves to intrude on the black community. Oh shit! <laughs> Had he come in as Grand Mason. Yeah, it's going a little, di it's a going a little different. different. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely going a little different. Yeah, niggas not niggas not getting behind that. Yeah, he's rebranded himself. That's the name he gave no, himself. They, no, really no, read the. Hmm? Go ahead. Is that his real name? That's what Rolling Stone said. <laughs> Rolling Stone said that's his name. Okay. What's the problem? No, nothing. Anyway, uh, come on. What else is important? Well, Mason that sound a little different. Yeah, yeah, sound that sounds different. That's though. All. Oh, got it. That nigga walk in and Yo, say, how you doing, Grand on. Mason, Grand Mason? Are we going to do the conspiracy shit again? Because they killing me. Like, for real. Keep me on the conspiracy. I, I want to stay away from y'all, but I still want to be up to date what on any conspiracies. Shit? Well, Mason mean? sounds crazy. It hits different. Why? Because of the word Mason? Grand Mason. Grand Mason sounds just, it just sounds like a person. It sounds very KKK-ish. Yeah. It sounds like that's his clan name. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, not saying it is. Well, I'm not saying it is. Just, right, okay. Yeah. I'm with, I, I'm with, hold get, on. You know what, y'all? And don't get crazy during Ramadan, nigga. I'm, uh, hold on, y'all. <laughs> I'm get, with y'all. I agree. There you go. You learn it. You learn it. <laughs> <laughs> my man right there. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so Snowfall is having a spinoff. Language, culture, and religion, which is why so many people in areas like Quebec speak French to this day. The Grand Mason's descendants by the 19th century were spread all around the world. There was one particular Grand Mason family, though, who by the 1800s still resided in present-day Quebec. Amable and his wife Selena moved to Nashua, New Hampshire in the 1890s, where Amable made great money as a molder. In 1907, they welcomed a son in this world, Oscar Napoleon Grand Mason. His middle name, of course, inspired by Napoleon Bonaparte, a French military and political leader who rose to prominence during the French Revolution and went on to become the Emperor of France. He is known to have reinstated slavery in the French colonies in 1802. Invited to your show of yours, I had to look up like 30 things. So I thought you were inviting me to fuck you. And you thought girlfriend. I was black when you no, first well, got yeah, invited. No, well, yeah, that too. Also, <laughs> well, because I already said Adam does hip hop, so I didn't know you were just a slave owner oh, and not the. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Listen, I'm here to rep a. Okay. I like how, oh, the, like, bleep that. I After it had been abolished during the French Revolution, Oscar stayed in New Hampshire his whole life, where he married his wife, Irene Bochard. They each worked as a shoemaker and a stenographer, respectively. They made a great living, were very popular in the state of New Hampshire, and became staunch Democrats. They went on to have kids of their own, 
two of which were sons named Joe and Philip Grand Mason. Joe Grand Mason was a highly ambitious kid, having already been interested in politics by high school. And two years after high school, he embarked with his father on a mission to put a Democrat in the governor's office for the first time in nearly 40 years. Graham Mason was just 21 when his candidate, John W. King, was elected governor, becoming just the second Democrat to hold office since 1915. Joe's passion for politics began at a pretty young age, said his brother, Phil Graham Mason. He was only 25, maybe 26, when he first ran for Ward 7 Alderman and won. Joseph Grand Mason would go on to a 50-year career in state and national politics, serving as a senior governmental appointee under three presidents. Mike Dukakis wanted Joe Grand Mason to run his campaign for Massachusetts governor in 1974. Up next, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, an interview with Joe Grand Mason, who was manager of the Dukakis campaign for governor in 1974. Part of our continuing series, a look at the next president. Joe Grand Maison, now chairman of the New Hampshire Democratic Party, but also Michael Dukakis's campaign manager during the successful race for governor in 1974. How did you meet him? Well, Dukakis was considered a political outsider at the time, but Joe's name was floating around everywhere among Democratic circles, and the two won by an upset. Dukakis became governor of Massachusetts. By then, Joe became quite the commodity to the Democrats. His deep knowledge and reputation as a people person served Graham Mason well in 1975 when he led the upset rematch Senate campaign of John Durkin against Republican Congressman Luis Wyman. In addition, Graham Mason served as an advisor to former New York Governor Mario Cuomo and led the successful U.S. Senate election of Frank Lautenberg of New Jersey. He was helping put Democrats in office left and right. Joe's parents, Oscar and Irene Graham Mason, were staunch Democrats, and they funded, promoted, and volunteered for Democratic office runners any way they could. Joe's younger brother, Philip Joseph Grand Mason, naturally followed in his parents and older brother's footsteps and became an alderman of Nashua, New Hampshire, and gained national attention for his role in helping Bill Clinton win the New Hampshire Democratic primary in 1992. He was a prominent supporter of Clinton's campaign and was instrumental in getting Clinton to make several campaign stops in New Hampshire. In 1994, Graham Mason was indicted on charges of mail fraud related to his business dealings, and he ultimately pleaded guilty to one count of mail fraud in 1996. However, in one of his last acts as president, Clinton pardoned Graham Mason in 2001. This decision was controversial and criticized by some people who believed that it was an abuse of presidential power. Some people believed it was an abuse of power because Graham Mason had been convicted of mail fraud and had not served his full sentence. Additionally, some critics saw the pardon as a political favor granted to someone who had helped Clinton win New Hampshire in 1992 election. They argued that this undermined the integrity of the justice system and created the appearance of political cronyism which it does seem unfair that he was able to legally help Bill win New Hampshire and not have to do time because Bill became president and was able to pardon him. It's like a cheat code, heavy on the cheat. Joe Graham Mason went on to pass away in June 2022 at 79. With the passing of Joe Graham Mason, New Hampshire has lost a political legend, says U.S. Senator Jeanne Shaheen. His younger brother is still alive today. Philip Grand Mason went on to get married to his wife, Anne Grand Mason, and have two kids, born Sarah and Adam Grand Mason. Two new generation Grand Masons, born from a powerful family that has lasted in Europe and the Americas several generations, ready to follow in their ancestors' footsteps and keep the power of their family name alive. Thanks for watching. His companions, however, the relationship between the French and the Caribbean population became hostile and warlike, 
resulting in the expulsion of the Caribbeans from the island in the late 17th century. This led to the introduction of slavery as the French settlers relied on the royal crown to enable the slave trade from Africa to exploit the island's resources. Black slaves were brought from Africa to work in the fields and in households. The economy was dominated by coffee production, but later shifted to tobacco and most importantly, sugarcane. The Grand Masons were known for their sugar plantation in Martinique. Let's talk about one of the earliest and most historically known descendants of the Grand Mason family, Eleanor de Grand Mason. According to family history, Eleanor was born in the 18th century in the town of Les Trois Elates, which is located on the island of Martinique in the Caribbean. She was the daughter of a wealthy plantation owner and was herself married to a sugar plantation owner named Joseph de Grand Mason. Martinique began to get dangerous for the French. The British made several attempts to capture Martinique. The island changed hands several times during the 18th century as the French and the British fought for control of the Caribbean. It is not clear when Eleanor de Grand Mason left and ended up in New France, aka present-day Canada, with her husband and family, but they likely moved there in the mid-1700s as Eleanor was already married and had children before leaving Martinique. Eleanor was a historically significant figure in New France. She was a landowner, a savvy businesswoman, and an active wife leaving a very large offspring both in France and in America. Their descendants have gone on to form the World Association of the De Grand Mason. The British and French were constantly at war for territory. The first major British attempt to capture Martinique was in 1667. The British failed to keep full control until 1794 during the French Revolutionary Wars. The 1794 invasion was successful and the island was occupied by the British until 1802 when it was returned to French control under the terms of the Treaty of Amiens. The Seven Years War also affected New France aka present day Canada. The Grand Masons were allegedly soldiers and heavy funders for this war against the British. It's also said that the Rothschilds family and other banks were heavy funders for the war on the British side. New France eventually was taken over by the British. When the British took control in 1763, they did not kick the French citizens out of the country though. In fact, the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Seven Years War and transferred the control of Canada from France to Britain included a provision that protected the rights of French-speaking inhabitants to maintain their language, culture, and religion. Which is why so many people in areas like Quebec speak French to this day. Let me tell you this, man. When hate don't work, they start spreading lies. So, um, I've been seeing a lot of lies spread about me recently. Which, by the way, it also goes into the fact of how low powered these lies are because all the major outlets have not touched these lies okay they have not fed into these lies and i actually credit all the major outlets for that well, all right. you know, why won't they like you feel me be blasting like just adam, take your ig I take your ig act. but why won't they blast adam like if it was you bro you'll be all over the shade room and everything right now like why is this hate coming for adam though like nigga, they'd be posting all the clips if it was you because yeah. his last name is Grand Mason. That's what you think? Hey, that's a real thing, though. So, so what happened?